what if there was something in nature that could show us why and how it's possible to start reducing landfill? It's now the year 2020, and uh, it's, even though we're entering the most advanced technological decade of our human history, it's still quite impossible to consider a world with no landfill. And one must ask why that is why. Considering here where we stand in Ngunnawal country, no landfill and sustainability has been the norm for thousands of generations. Materials that we use in structures and devices and that we take for granted are all human created. This includes things like plastic, steel, and pretty much anything else that you can think of. Materials take a heck of a lot of energy to produce and are a big, actually the biggest strain on our planet. Here you can see our Earth in its uh, majestic glory. And it's important to remember that all the materials that we take for granted, the ingredients for them actually come from Earth. And I think it's pretty fair to say that the Earth is a little bit fed up uh, with what's been going on recently. In fact, the biggest single users of electricity in New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland are metal producers, hammering home our silent but powerful expectations as a society um, in our expectations of what a materials-driven society actually is. Our prolific use of materials is so entrenched in the norm of, of our thinking and that's largely because there's actually nobody alive on the planet today that hasn't lived in a period where materials are just thought of as coming from a factory. Uh, that has created a mindset where uh, it's often thought that there's an infinite supply of things in the basement of a factory, which is actually not the case. And actually, just last week, I heard someone saying that anything you want, you can just get it from Alibaba. So our... Uh, the connection between our, our tech-driven ambitions and the strain on the planet is broken. And that's a, a link that we now must uh, unbreak. So how can one break the link between uh, materials proliferation and the strain on the planet? Fortunately, the last decade has seen tremendous advances that are now at a stage of advancement where they can start to come together. There's two particular things that I want to concentrate on. And the first of those is digital manufacturing, in particular, additive manufacturing, otherwise known as 3D printing. 3D printing has allowed us to start to think very differently about the way in which we use materials and the type of materials that we use. In addition, 3D printing is a bit more like nature in that it adds material instead of taking material away to get to a final structure. So it genuinely is an additive process. Secondly, there's automation and data exchange in manufacturing, cyber physical systems, cloud computing, and the internet of things, which have rapidly accelerated in the past decade and give us the ability to be object oriented. Advanced computing has allowed us to help unlock nature's secrets with things like generative design, and artificial intelligence being tremendously important. I mentioned nature in those last couple of examples, and uh, I want to spend the rest of the, the, the talk today talking you through an example. There's been many a TED talk previously uh, discussing 3D printing and advanced materials, so I thought I'd do something different and talk about the greatest materials designer ever, and that is Mother Nature. She is very, very, very smart, and also has about a billion years head start on us all. So it's important to pay attention to her. What you see here is a naturally occurring structure known as Venus's flower basket. This structure is found at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean in the dark depths of, a, of at least 1,000 metres below sea level where there is no light whatsoever. And most typically, this structure is found at depths greater than 2,000 metres below sea level. This structure is actually made out of what you and I know as glass, which uh, chemists and engineers know of as silica. What's really interesting about this structure is it's comprised in a very unique geometry that exploits free space and very detailed structural elements. It's so special 
that uh, its properties are superior to that of steel, and in fact, it's much, much more lightweight considering what it's been made out of. So Professor Joanna Eisenberg at the Weiss Institute at Harvard uh, has spent a big chunk of the last few years trying to understand this structure, and she attributes the various length scales in this structure from nanometers right through to millimeters and then exploiting free space to create structures over tens of centimeters as holding the key to this marvel and its phenomenal strength. What Venus's flower basket has uh, allowed us to do as engineers is to challenge the way in which we think about materials. It's also showed us that we know very little, even though the year is 2020, but it's also showed us the exceptional promise that can come from nature-inspired biomimetic designs. A little bit closer to the surface of Earth, and glass is one of these materials that's been used for centuries. Um, and interestingly, um, I think it's fair to say that we know very little about glass as a human race. Uh, some things you may not know about glass um, that are typified in these videos um, is that when glass is very, very thin, or in fine dimensions, below about 20 microns, so about a fifth of the thickness of your, of your hair, it can become infinitely flexible, which is really interesting because that probably would have saved you a lot of heartache when you were younger and you were breaking things. Um, the other interesting thing about glass is when it's in large dimensions, um, and you can see that video on the right where it's dropped from a great height on a piece of steel, glass can actually be very tough. Now, tough is actually an, toughness is an engineering quantity that means the ability to absorb energy. So glass can be very tough in large dimensions and resist cracking. So very, very interesting uh, material, and I have to confess once again that as a materials engineer, we don't understand these properties very well, other than knowing that they're geometry dependent. But then this poses the question, can we now take glass and, and use glass in a way that nature does, like Venus's flower basket, and put together geometric arrangements that could potentially replace steel. Now, if you think about the way in which we work with glass at the moment, things like glass blowing, grinding and cutting, it's certainly not going to cut it. However, welcome to 3D printing, and we crack the door open to Industry 4.0. 3D printing in the last decade has really uh, had some very tremendous wins. 3D printing of polymers and metals is now a commercial reality, and in fact, companies like General Electric are using 3D printed metal components in aircraft bits at the moment, and companies like BMW are certainly using 3D printed polymeric components in vehicles. But 3D printing of glass has remained at the bleeding edge, and still does. But fortunately, there's a few groups that are giving it a red hot go. So some of the examples you see here are from Neri Oxman's group at the MIT Media Lab. The other one is the Micron 3DP Swarovski collaboration in Austria. And the one on the bottom left is actually Australia's own, but actually Canberra's own, uh, maple glass. So what you see here, in spite of being at very, very hot temperatures, is actually really, really, really cool. And the results? are very promising. So what you see here is a selection of things that have been uh, created from 3D printing of glass. And you can see that there's tremendous opportunities in controlling dimensions. There's also tremendous opportunities in creating infill and using free space as a design variable, as you can see in the middle there. And that gets us one step closer to nature. But what's perhaps the most important is the ability to take a computationally generated design, turn that into a digital file, and deploy that with great accuracy, as you can see in that example on the right. And that is, is the very first important step towards generative design. So what you see here may look like a collection of widgets, but actually, they're not just widgets. They're widgets full of promise. It's no secret that Australia, like many other countries, is having a, uh, a waste and a landfill crisis. Uh, our low-value exports are now no longer able to leave Australia, and our systems of a circular economy and recycling are not yet up to the task. However, next year, in 2021, Victoria will be one of the first places on the world, so the state of Victoria, to introduce a purple bin just for glass recycling and glass only. So, based on everything that you've now learnt about glass in the last four minutes, 
what an opportunity, and what an opportunity this is. So, uh, just like perhaps in the Jetsons, you could conceive a situation where you have a glass printer, and in the top you could throw something broken or something you want to discard, and crunch, 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 it would create a computationally designed, value-added product with no further strain on the planet and no further uh, energy implications on the planet. And you actually see an example of that uh, on your right, where you can see a commodity glass bottle that was broken turning into something else with a computational design of infill and water tightness. Certainly from the point of view of materials design, we must be able to design things that are uh, damage resistant, but when we can't do that, they need to be recyclable, and when we can't do that, they, oh, we must do that, and then when required, things must be recycled. Absolutely no doubt. That, at this point, is the best hope that we have in terms of trying to minimize the proliferation and damage on the planet. Now, for those that are very astute listeners, you probably would have realized where was the thousand degree temperatures at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean making Venus's flower basket? And it turns out that Mother Nature is always a step ahead because Venus's flower basket, when it's grown at the bottom of, of, of the Pacific Ocean, is not like 3D printing where we layer material, but it's actually grown organically. With no light around, Mother Nature is able to take parts of the seawater, particularly silicic acid, and turn that into silica. So while Venus's flower basket is on the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, tethered to the ocean floor, it is actually a living creature and part of animalia. So there's still a lot that we can learn, and a lot that we can learn for bringing us one step closer to nature. I am, however, optimistic, because if there was any evidence that being one with nature was possible, it's certainly here in Australia where the indigenous Australians not only achieved it, but they achieved it thousands of years ago. My hope is that all of you now, uh, young and old, pay particular attention to what things are made out of. As you now know, there's no infinite supply of material and there's no trapdoor uh, at, at a basement of, of materials factories with an infinite supply. My hope for the next decade is that everything that we make for human consumption comes from our waste streams. The way in which we're going to make that possible is by leaning on Industry 4.0 and advanced computation, including artificial intelligence that will drive generative design and help us mimic nature much closer. We have a multi-generational and social contract with our planet, and I leave you with the message that the future is clear. So thank you very much, and I hope you never look at a glass bottle in the same way. <laughs>